Thank you. We'll move to Tim now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So yesterday, um, the NGOs and the trade union representatives on this panel um, gave a very clear message to the United States. It was a message to step aside, because what we see here in Durban is the US blocking, blocking, blocking. And that is not going to get us to the agreement that we need in the next four days. But if the US needs to step aside, then other countries, the European Union and developing countries, need to step up. And I'm going to talk about All right, we'll get underway. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My name is Hannah McKinnon. I'm with the Climate Action Network Canada. Uh, this is the daily Climate Action Network International press briefing. Climate Action Network International is a network of over 700. I'll be met with moral principles. Thank you. We'll move to Tim now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So yesterday, um, the NGOs and the trade union representatives on this panel um, gave a very clear message to the United States. It was a message to step aside, because what we see here in Durban is the U.S. blocking, blocking, blocking. And that is not going to get us to the agreement that we need in the next four days. But if the U.S. needs to step aside, then other countries, the European Union and developing countries, need to step up. And I'm going to talk about three areas that could be seen as a sort of litmus test of whether or not they're doing that. The first is on the question of a legally binding agreement to tackle climate change. And last night um, told us something about where countries are at on that question, because there was a discussion of the legal options uh, for a future agreement. Now, the United States is setting an unreasonably high bar for, uh, uh, for reaching a, uh, a comprehensive legal agreement. They're talking about legal parity with developing countries. They talk about it because they know it can't be delivered. And in the discussions last night, the US took what is option four on the table, which is simply to stop, stop discussions. Uh, we're not going to reach anything out of this group. Let's just stop talking. Uh, China in the last days, as you will all be aware, put out some really positive, encouraging signals about their willingness to consider taking legally binding agreements in the future. And we really welcome that. That is the sort of constructive attitude that we need in these negotiations. They show that they've come here uh, in good faith and willing to negotiate an agreement. We need that. But we heard last night some signals which didn't quite match what we'd heard from China over the weekend, that maybe they weren't looking for the full sort of legal agreement that at least we have in mind as NGOs, that we need a new protocol or a new treaty. And so it's really important that we hear from China and India, Brazil in the next days, a bit more clarity about exactly what this legal agreement is that they um, are willing to, to work towards. Um, now, it's early days in the negotiations. Uh, all parties are uh, putting chips on the table and not revealing their whole hand. So we can understand perhaps why um, they're not going to come out fully in support of the full legal agreement at this stage. But, you know, it's important. We've, we've heard from China. It was encouraging. We need more of that, and we need them to clarify exactly what sort of an agreement um, they think uh, we, we can agree in this process. It will be important as well that those countries stand with their vulnerable neighbours, uh, the least developed countries, the island states that have got the most ambitious uh, plans for a new agreement on the table. And for the European Union, they're the developed country that is most committed to a legally binding agreement. They have the domestic legislation in place to support that. They have been ardent advocates for the Kyoto Protocol in the past. And if we are to build a legally binding architecture to tackle climate change that covers all all, all countries, the European Union will have to be at the heart of that and they will have to drive it in the next three or four days. First and foremost, of course, they need to ensure the continuity of the Kyoto Protocol. There can be no question of putting some sort of weak political declaration forward and thinking that that's sufficient. It's not. We need a real Kyoto Protocol, ratifiable, with a five-year commitment period, with loopholes closed, with new targets um, attached. 
So we're looking for the European Union to set that and give the clearest possible signal that that's what they're headed towards. And we need them to stand with the developing countries, the most vulnerable, to stand firm on a timeline that will see a new legal agreement. In the timeline that is set by science, we have a window. We need to get this agreement before 2020 if we're to get emission reductions at the scale that are needed in the timeline that is set by the science. So we need the EU to stand strong on that. So that's on the legal questions. The second litmus test is around ambition or around the scale of emission reductions. We know it's abundantly clear from all the studies, the UNEP report, which is going to be prese oh, was presented earlier, uh, some of you may have seen, that the gap between the mitigation pledges currently on the table and what science says is needed is actually growing. It's large and it's growing, and we need to reverse it. And the big worry at these talks for, for, uh, for us is that the United States is doing a very successful job at reframing the discussion about future emission reduction targets. And they're talking not about the post-2012 regime anymore, but about post-2020. Okay, we start a process to negotiate new targets, but it's for post-2020. And it's quite clear from all of the science that 2020 is too late for two degrees, let alone the 1.5 degrees that we know is needed, that 100 countries in this process know is needed to ensure their security, their food security uh, in the years ahead. So the US blocking on that. The question, therefore, a key question for China, for India, for Brazil, for the European Union, is how, how can we ensure that we get the next round of mitigation targets beyond the most ambitious that are currently on the table? How can we get those brought forward before 2020 and as soon before, uh, as, uh, as much before 2020 as possible? If we allow the US to set the framework here that this is all about what happens in 2020 and beyond. We can wave goodbye to two degrees. We're set for four degrees, and we're set for the sorts of devastating impacts on the lives and livelihoods of poor people that the bishop talked about. Let's be clear about that. The next few days could determine whether or not we have still have a chance to get below two degrees. That's what's at stake. Key question, therefore, for the Europeans and for the other big, uh, big emerging economies as to whether or not we're going to have a process to get new, deeper emission reduction targets on the table. Final uh, limits test, finance. We know we've been saying that, of course, it's important that we get the Green Climate Fund, which was established in Cancun, up and running as soon as possible. There are negotiations ongoing. We hope and expect those to go through and for the concerns that have been raised to be addressed. But the critical question on finance at this COP is where will the money come from to fill the fund? We have had funds in the past. Ten years ago, there was a fund set up for the least developed countries to deal with their most urgent adaptation needs. It was the first time that the COP came to Africa. Ten years on, the promises that were made were unfulfilled. That, that fund is all but empty. It is nothing like at the scale needed to address the challenge. We can't afford to set up another empty shell here in Durban. The good news is that in the current finance negotiating text, there is one concrete source of finance identified that would generate money at the scale of billions of dollars per year outside an additional two government budget contributions. And it's to raise finance from international shipping. It's in the text. And it came to the text from developing countries. And we need to see the European Union, China, India, and the vulnerable countries fight like hell to keep it in there. Because we know full well the United States is, is putting pressure left, right, and center to strip out any reference to any specific sources of finance in that text. The European Union put that in their text in Panama. They have it in the ministerial mandate given to them uh, by their environment ministers in October, and we expect them to fight for it. And we need China and India, Brazil, and the vulnerable countries to rally, rally around. That's the source of finance that can set this fund apart. It's the one thing that could be a real success story for this COP, and we hope that the ministers that are arriving now will seize that opportunity and strike a deal. Thanks. And with that, we'll